Hello and good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Cocktails in Conversation. My name is Marie Whipple, and I am here. I'm excited to be here at the Boilermaker um, Station Welcome Center. This is a beautiful center that they opened up a couple of years ago when we had to move from the other um, from PMU over here to the Stewart Center. And I do want to point out the fact that there is an amazing photo booth here that is available to both students, faculty, staff, um, and alumni. So if you happen to be on campus, it's free. Go ahead and get, get your picture shot so, taken. So my name is Marie Whipple, and I help those stay connected, get involved, and give back. Thank you. So our guest this evening is Dr. Debbie Knapp. Um, she, Dr. Knapp is the Dolores McCall Professor and Distinguished Professor of Comparative Oncology and the Director of the Whirling Comparative Oncology Research Center in the College of Veterinary uh, Medicine and the program co-leader of the Purdue Institute for Cancer Research. Um, Dr. Knapp will be presenting Dogs Are Men's Best, Man's and Women's Best Friend, which will address recent studies on improving the out the Outlook for Dogs with Naturally Occurring Cancer. Let's all please welcome Dr. Knapp. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like we're both feeling a little bit under the weather. I think we are, yeah. <laughs> keep our germs to ourselves. Yep, so. yep. So that's the reason for the, the mask this evening. So hello, hello. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. We oh, really appreciate my this. My pleasure. I'm glad to. Glad to have the chance to come talk to you all. Well, thank you. The Purdue Women's Network is part of the Purdue for Life Foundation. It was founded um, about five years ago, and we just do all kinds of activities and events out in the community to help people connect back to the university. And one of the things I do is highlight staff and faculty who have done amazing research um, on this show. So thank you again. So we'll start off with some fun facts here, the audience. So please, first of all, if you could just type in the chat where you're calling in from, and let us know if you have a fur baby. So while you do that, um, I will go ahead and give some fun facts about um, Dr. Knapp. Please call me Debbie. Yeah. Okay, Debbie. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So let's see if anyone's already already typed a message in the chat. West Lafayette Briard, out Indiana. No fur babies at this time, but you're still joining us, Libby. Thank you. We've got someone coming in from New York, Arizona a top PVM fam from Lafayette and mother of Billy and Sue Brandy. We've got a 16 pound nine year old energy cat Garfunkel. Okay, <laughs> so we've got several calls here. Well, thank you for, for, thank you for letting us know that you, what, you, if you have a fur baby or not. Okay, let's guess everybody some facts about um, Debbie. Can you, oh, someone's got a dish, Dutch on. Okay, um, what year did she arrive in? Lafayette. If we could just put in the chat, where do you think everybody, what year do you think Debbie arrived here in Lafayette? <laughs> While they're trying to put that down, someone did say they have two dogs and a horse. Awesome. And that dog. Sure. And lived to 17 thanks to a new melanoma vaccine. Awesome. Well, that's, that's interesting. 2000, someone says that you arrived. Another one said 2005. <laughs> Joanne Troutner, do you know her? She's wonderful. Sure. Yes, she's wonderful. Um, and 1989, 1985, someone's been talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your move here in 1985. I came here in, in 1985 for three years, and three years only. Okay. And I had only been on campus a few weeks, and I just knew that this was my calling. This oh. is the best place to do comparative oncology research. and. Mm -hmm fell in love with the program and the university and the community and haven't left yet. Awesome. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you. So some of you got 1985. Yeah. Another fun fact, can, you, can anyone guess um, which state she did do, spent how much? Small animal practice. Small yeah. animal practice. Right out of veterinary school. Right out of veterinary school. She stayed in the state for how many months? I was there about a year and a half. About a year and a half. Can anyone yeah. guess where she did that? North Carolina, someone said. Good guess. Illinois, Pennsylvania. I was in North Carolina for a while. That's 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 a good guess. Right? Yeah. Okay. North Carolina. That was Anne that said that. Illinois, New York. You want to tell the crowd? 
Uh, sure. I was in Anchorage, Alaska. That was my first job out of veterinary school. Okay. So. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience there in Alaska? It was, it was amazing. Uh, my husband had a job with the Corps of Engineers and had signed on for three years. And so uh, he took that position when I was in veterinary school. So I went up there as soon as I could get out of veterinary school. The, the practice was a lot like small animal practice anywhere, but we did have lots of really cool opportunities. I got to go out on the Iditarod um, dog sled race and be a veterinarian at one of the checkpoints. And oh, that was a, certainly probably a once in a lifetime experience. Absolutely, that's yeah. fun. Have you been back? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Two or three times. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. It's absolutely, well, that's wonderful. I don't get a lot of people that say they've been to Alaska. So that's wonderful. So thank you. Sure. Okay. Let's get into the meat of this um, this interview. So, history. Can you share us about share us about the work that you do here at Purdue? I do what's um, called comparative oncology research, and we study naturally occurring cancer in pet animals um, for several reasons. One, we'd like to help those pet animals. Um, two, we'd like to learn information that helps the next generation of pet animals. And three, there's certain cancers naturally occurring cancers, say in dogs, that very, very, very much resemble the same cancer in people. And so we learn information from dogs that can generate new information to potentially help human cancer patients. Wow. How long have you been in, in this line of work? Uh, since 1985. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us about that aha moment when you made your discovery? I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's been one aha moment. Mm -hmm. um, when, once you gain experiences and then you look back on them, you do recognize that there were certain points that, that were really, really important. Um, for us, one of the ones was when I was actually in practice in North Carolina between veterinary school, well, between Alaska and Purdue, mm -hmm. we observed some, some anti-cancer effects with a class of drugs that weren't really developed as anti-cancer agents. And at the time, I don't think I really appreciated the magnitude of that observation. But then I came to Purdue and we studied it for some years and it's really become one of the major ways to treat uh, many types of cancer in dogs. Wow. So I think that was probably an aha moment, but at the moment I didn't say aha. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, wow. Please, everyone, if you do have questions for Debbie, please put them in the chat, and I'll be happy to share those questions with her as we uh, when, throughout this throughout this session. Well, thank you. So the next kind of question kind of leads into it. So, what are some of the most fascinating findings that you've had since since you began your work in this in this area? I think certainly the the observation of the anti cancer mm -hmm. effects of that drug was important. We sort of leapfrog from that into a whole array of studies related to urinary bladder cancer because the drugs we were studying, we initially didn't know what cancer type they might work the best against. And so we, our initial studies had dogs with many different types of cancer, but some of those that responded the best had bladder cancer. Mm -hmm. And so that sent us down that pathway and, and that's really morphed into a really a multi-prong approach against bladder cancer. Um, we had this research map and we say, okay, how, how are we going to beat this disease? Mm. And so we have a whole set of um, studies aimed at prevention because, mm. and that, that certainly was an aha moment, you, you know, that's a whole mm -hmm. lot better to prevent it than try to Absolutely. treat it once it occurs. And then we have studies looking at how do we make better use of the drugs that we already have access to. And then connected to the Purdue Institute for Cancer Research, we have the opportunity to take drugs developed in the Institute and show that those work in dogs. Um, and then we're trying to also understand the really specific biology of the cancer because by doing that, we can figure out how to treat individuals and treat individuals oh. differently versus just treating everybody the same. Mm. So I, I think it's, you know, I'd, I'd say there have been probably multiple aha moments. So mm. Looking back on it was, you know, was something special. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And we are also thankful about this research. When it came, Purdue Today, when they published the article, it was like oh, everybody okay. was cheering you on. They're like, oh, my goodness, you have to find out more about how this happened, oh, where you. it happened. I mean, what led you to this moment, et cetera. So. Well, I think that, I think that article 
really touched on something that, that I feel strongly about, and that is we need to do more to prevent cancer mm -hmm. than to try to react to it mm -hmm. once it's already established and sometimes has already spread. Because mm -hmm. in this study that we did where we were able to find it early through screening, the remission rate and the length of remission and the survival were twice as long oh, just, wow. by, just by backing up the clock and finding the cancer in its earliest stages. So, you know, we'd like to build on that and, uh, you know, learn how to prevent other cancers too. Mm -hmm. yeah. so can you talk to us a little bit about, about the, your future projects in this particular area? Sure. Um, so I think at the moment our, our projects are, well, there are several of them, but, mm -hmm. but we're building on this early detection, early intervention work. Um, we started out doing this in Scottish Terriers because they inherit mm. such a high risk for bladder cancer, and now we're expanding it into other dogs that have a high inherited risk, like West Highland White Terriers, um, Beagles, Wire Hair Fox Terriers, um, Shelties, and so oh. we're expanding it. and. And what we've learned is that the, the um, samples we collected while we were screening these dogs, we collected blood samples and urine samples, and if they develop cancer, tumor samples, and those are a gold mine because mm. there's so many different things we can study in those samples now. Like we're, we're, we're currently doing a study in which we're going to analyze the inherited DNA variants to see how those have a role in who gets cancer and who doesn't. Wow. and what type of cancer they get, and how well do they respond to therapy. And amongst dogs exposed to certain environmental carcinogens, like exposed to cigarette smoke, you know, cigarette smoke in itself is not everything because there are dogs exposed to smoke that don't get cancer, and there are dogs exposed to smoke that do. And so we're huh. analyzing the inherited DNA to understand what is it that pushes that dog over to the cancer side of things. So. It, wow. It, you can't see me, but my mouth is dropping <laughs> for all this, all this new information. And I mean, it's yeah. just, it, and I know it's an ongoing research, yeah. but I mean, how much, how much more longer do you think, you know, before you can come up with something that's, you said you start, started with Scottish Terriers, yep. or are you going, and then you'll be branching out to other yep. dogs. And right. what does that timeline look like when you have to, when you start well, to Well, the study at, we did in Scotties took uh, three years. So, okay. you know, it's, it's going to take some time, but, okay. but we already have a good idea how to start, so that'll mm -hmm. speed things along. Mm -hmm. But then on the, on the treatment end of things, when we can't prevent it, another major project we're doing is with a new immunotherapy. So we're very eager. That that's right now in the safety, state, the safe, safety testing stages, so we're mm -hmm. eager to get that into a pet dog trial, too. Okay, okay. Okay, are the dogs here um, that you work with, the Scottish Terriers? So, so these are people's pets, oh, okay. and so they live at home. It, think of this as like a clinical trial in humans. If a person has cancer or if they're in a prevention trial and at risk for having cancer, periodically they'll go see their physicians, and just like for us, periodically these dogs come see us, and we do the screening test, and if we suspect there's cancer, we'll get a biopsy, and then we talk to the family about how to treat it. But then the rest of the time, they're at home, just just being happy pets. Okay, so. okay. I know, I, I bet some people are asking, it's like, how do we know if our dog has cancer? Well, um, there are a couple of things. Your, your dog may give you some clues. They may start demonstrating symptoms that they haven't before, but depending on the dogs breed, there may be some tests that could be done to help determine if cancer is present or not. We're, that's really a new area though. So I think in veterinary medicine, we're not yet set up to do all the screening I'd like to see us do. Mm. So usually it's the dog telling the owner that something's wrong. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And what kind of signs would they give? I'm sorry? What kind of signs would the dog give it to would, their owners? It really would depend if they are developing cancer, where it is in the body. So like in bladder cancer, they might have accidents in the house, ask to go out more often, have blood in their urine. Um, but if it's a different type of cancer, let's say it's a, a mast cell tumor, which is a really common tumor on the skin, you may see a little bump. And then because those tumors contain histamine, if the dog bumps it, it'll swell up and get red and itchy. And then, and a few hours later, it goes back down. So if you see a, a mass, it comes and goes. You know, that's something to, 
talk to your veterinarian about to see whether there might be a mast cell tumor. Mm -hmm. If it's a tumor involving the gastrointestinal tract, then they're likely to see their appetite drop off or see vomiting or diarrhea or weight loss and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. These are some things that when we get our dog checked every year that they would be screening. Uh -huh. uh, okay, yeah. so it's something that's normally done. Okay. Yep. Okay, makes me wonder about my dog. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, thank you for that. Okay, um, please, if you have any questions regarding her research, please feel free to put them in the chat. But as for now, we're going to move on to the next set of, set of questions. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you tell us about women in veterinary medicine? Women are a big part of veterinary medicine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Women make up the majority of every oh. every class of veterinary students and oh, okay. women are you know they make up more than half of the profession so it's 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 and women are in all aspects of veterinary medicine yes a lot of us like small animal but they're women doing equine hmm. doing you know cattle they're they're women in all aspects of veterinary medicine it's a profession that at least since I've been in veterinary school has been incredibly welcoming to women Okay. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate the women that went before me. They're the ones that broke down a lot of the barriers. Mm -hmm. And so by the time my class was in veterinary school, it was no big deal for it to be okay. a woman in veterinary school. Is that something that's been since, since you started, or is it something that's, that women have moved towards to in the last 10 years or so? Can you tell it's, us about that? I think there? even my class was over half women. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's been a thing okay. for a long time. Okay. Yeah. Oh. That's, that's great to hear. <laughs> so I'm not sure about the next, but, but talk to us about any struggles you might have experienced as a woman throughout your career. Again, I think I've been really, really fortunate because of the women who went before because me. Of the women. You know, mm -hmm. I, from time to time, would encounter some very old-fashioned people, you know, that had different views and different ideas about what women should be doing, but I just... You know, I just sort of put that behind me. I, you know, at the time, I found it irritating, offensive, and, and, and might have, you know, put a little energy into worrying about it. And now it's like, you know, it's, it's behind me, and, mm -hmm. and I'm just not going to let that hold us back. Okay. That's, that's a great tip for up, up inspiring yeah. uh, veterinarians that we have coming. Um, well, who was your inspiration to be who you are today and why did you choose that person? I think there were, I think I'd name, if, if I could, sure. name a few. Okay. okay. <laughs> so obviously my parents, you okay. know, my parents, my parents were amazing. They raised my sister and, and myself to believe we could do anything we wanted to do. Okay. And, and so, and my mom, I sensed, lived through me because her, um, she worked as a uh, homemaker and as a bookkeeper and a secretary, and I think she would have much rather been a scientist. Oh, but okay. there was one. There's one woman in my family. I'd, I'd really, I'd, I really would would uh, say something about. She was my great aunt, and her name was Virginia. And so she was born around 1900, and she went to college and then she went to grad school at Berkeley when women didn't do that kind of thing. Yeah. She took a train from North Carolina to Berkeley to go to grad school and then took the train back. Right. And then she um, actually ended up teaching English at the high school and college level. And right. she coached the girls, uh, her high school girls basketball team to the oh, state wow. championship. Wow. <laughs> back when they traveled to away games on the okay. train. So, wow. you know, at the time, I, I knew her, I didn't appreciate how significant that was. But, you know, it was, for us, it was, that's, you know, that's what women do. It's okay. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but looking mm -hmm. back, I think that she and some other, you know, women in the family just really had a big, had a big, uh, you know, emphasis in what I did. So you had a lot of people that you could yeah. look up to to see how do oh, I yeah. follow that same path. And then I, I worked path. with a primary care veterinarian in North Carolina named Tommy Needham for many years. And, he was incredible. He just he had a an extremely high quality practice, and he he saw something in me to to take time to teach me stuff, and and uh, you know I I'm indebted to what I learned from him as well as the mentors I've had at Purdue. I'm indebted to them every day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So when did you become interested in veterinary medicine? I think I was 12. 
12. What Go. made you interested in veterinary medicine? I knew I, I knew I was interested in science. Okay. And it's sort of odd because my favorite dog growing up to that point died when I was 12. Okay. And, and so one hand it was sad, but on the other hand, I wanted to learn and I wanted to help dogs like my dog. And then okay. when I had the chance to visit the veterinary hospital when my dad went to do his accounting work, I just thought it was the most fascinating place in the world. Okay, at 12, and yep. then it, you, it's course, great. <laughs> of course, at 12 and, and throughout college and early um, years after veterinary school, my plans were to become a primary care veterinarian in North Carolina and go back and buy the practice where I'd grown up. And then, mm -hmm. but as I said, I came here and I realized the comparative oncology research opportunities and, and that just fascinated me. When did yeah. you transition from that to oncology, actually? I started the transition not too long after I okay. graduated from veterinary school because I was in primary care and I, I really, really liked a lot of the aspects of it. Uh, but I also found myself most interested in the most complicated cases. <laughs> and so I thought, well, why did I become an internist? And then I can spend more of my time on these really complicated cases. And so when I came to Purdue, my training program was half internal medicine and half oncology. And so I stuck with that throughout in fact, I, for the first eight years of my faculty job, I was, I was working as an internist as well as an oncologist. And then the oncology end of it, there was just so much more going on and just so many, so many new things coming along that mm -hmm. uh, I, I, just, I just gravitated to oncology. Debbie, you, you say, when you say complex, give me an example what, as a complex situation or with a, with a dog. So... One of the things that drew me to oncology is the cancer biology, how cancer ticks, is really, really interesting. It's also scary, it's sad. But all the ways that cancer can develop and evolve and evade our therapies, there's just, there's a whole body of information that we need to get. But yet, to me, that feels more attainable than the very broad challenges across internal medicine, at least when I was doing internal medicine. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, felt like, I felt like cancer was moving quicker and that new discoveries were moving quicker. Um, now I think internal medicine, and I'm only speaking from the veterinary side, now I think internal medicine is, is probably right in there, but at the time there were more new discoveries in cancer than there were and say renal failure and heart failure and, and endocrinopathy. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Can you maybe tell us why you think why it, there was more focus on there than was in those other like renal? I think a large part of it was the uh, the the even even going back to the Nixon years and developing the National Cancer Institute. That okay. was a national initiative toward tackling cancer, okay. and I think that made a big difference. And one of the one of the true blessings I had at Purdue was my mentor here, Ralph Richardson, was one of the founding veterinarians doing comparative oncology research. And so he and Gordon Kopick and Bill Carlton, all three Purdue faculty, started a comparative oncology program back in 1979. That was like oh. six years before I got yeah. here. Yeah. So I got here and, and because there was already the recognition you can help animals and help people at the same time. I think there was just there were a lot more opportunities there, mm -hmm. and it's it's just grown even more mm -hmm. the last five to ten years. Because now the National Cancer Institute is putting significant funding into studies in which dogs will teach us things that then help people. Oh, that's so it's 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 the great time to be in yeah. this field. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have students coming in, freshmen coming in, go kind? hovering towards oncology. How does that work exactly when a freshman comes in and they want to study veterinary medicine? If a veterinary student wants to study oncology, what they do is they, they usually come work with, they can volunteer in our program, they can work with us for the summer. Um, then after they graduate from veterinary school, they usually do a one-year internship and then they do a three-year cancer training program called mm. an oncology residency. So it, it takes an extra four years, but if it gets you to a place mm -hmm. where you can do what you find most interesting, mm -hmm. then it's, you know, it's four years well spent. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, this is all fascinating. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that. Um, okay. 
So what advice would you give women coming into this field um, regarding like avenues to study and then making sure that they, their, their information stays relevant, their education stays relevant, and um, the longevity of their career in, in veterinary medicine? What advice would you give these students? I think I'd give the same advice to women and men, and okay. that is be a lifelong learner. Okay. Never stop learning. Okay. Um, read as much as you can. Mm -hmm. um, go to meetings and try to challenge yourself to always be learning something new, which is one of the other things I love about vet med. You're always, like, mm. I've, been, I've been a practicing veterinarian since 1983, and I could still go in clinics, and I can see something I've never seen before. Oh. So okay. I, I would say, you know, be a lifelong learner. Um, try to the extent possible to spend as much of your time doing what you really love. Um, mm -hmm. There's some jobs that you might not be as excited about them, I and if you have the opportunity to migrate to a job that you really find stimulating, you know, do it. Okay. And and I think you know, take care of yourself. I think that mm. the demands on veterinarians has always been really, really high, and that hasn't changed. I do think the profession's getting better <laughs> at promoting work like work life oh, balance. Okay. So mm -hmm. I think. You know, I think we're getting better, but um, you know, each person has to has to take care of themselves because it's a challenging, it can be a draining job. You know, it can get to you, and and uh, you know, it helps to have friends you can talk to. Mm -hmm. I, my, I love to go out and run or ride my bike, and mm -hmm. you know, do things that I enjoy. And and so, mm -hmm. you know, I'd say take care of yourself because if you get burned out and quit then you're not helping anybody. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yep. yeah. okay. Thank you for that. Um, you talked about the people in your life that have made an impact um, on, on your career or you as a person. Can you share about how women can support other women in, in this field or organization? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, again, many of the challenges I face, men face the same challenges, mm -hmm. but we, do, we also do have other challenges. Um, how do you balance which, again, applies to men, but how do you balance being a parent and working and, or it might be taking care of an elderly parent. You know, there are a lot of things outside of work that, that, demand, that demand our time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, you know, trying to compartmentalize, realize you can't be everything to everybody every day and do the best you can, mm -hmm. you know, each day, and that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah. How does one go about getting a mentor then? How do you get a mentor? Um, I think you um, look around where you are. Like at Purdue, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm considered one of the senior faculty, but there's still people I go to for advice all the time. And so for me, it's, it's looking at um, faculty peers. When I was in primary care practice, it was looking to the veterinarians that had been doing that longer than I had mm -hmm. you know, to get advice. Um, for me, I have sought out or been glad to benefit from the advice of other women. I think at Purdue, if you told me to name, you know, who are the women that made a difference, I'd, I'd name Marietta Harrison. Don't know if you're listening, Marietta, but, mm -hmm. but she was always a champion for women. Okay. Uh, she has been retired a little while, but you know, she's already always been a champion of, of women. Um, B.J. Taporowski's done the same. And, and so I, I, try to, I try to make myself available to women that you know, want to bounce ideas off of me or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so we do have some questions from the audience that I pulled okay. from today. Let me, let me just check in the chat if there's anyone that had posted um, any questions. Oh, there's some comments here. Let's go back. <laughs> okay. Um, really quick, what was the top moment of the, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Debbie. Is it Idi Tarad? This. Oh, the Iditarod. Iditarod. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, was, it was cool. I, I was stationed in a little town called McGrath, Alaska, and it was a bush ride plane out to get there, and I was there, I want to say, four or five days. Okay. And got to see all the teams come through, and, and uh, one four of my... Four five days of racing? Well, they, they race 1,000 miles. Okay. So, so I, I was enough that. far enough out on the trail that they had strung out by then. And so okay. I got to meet a busher... A busher excuse me, a musher, same Susan Butcher, and she won the Iditarod multiple times. Okay. And, then, 
In fact, the slogan at that time in Alaska was, Alaska's where men are men, but women win the Iditarod. So, oh, anyway, I love that. Yeah. But she was, <laughs> she was one of those okay. pioneering, she was one of the early woman mushers and was a real pioneer. Okay. And it was you know, special getting to meet her. And then just the people that we volunteered together. It was funny on the plane ride out, you know, we didn't really talk much. And then on the plane <laughs> ride back, we'd all become friends and oh. we were just chatting the whole time. So. <laughs> Lovely. When yeah. you went back to Alaska, were you able to do this uh, race again? No, because I went back um, in warmer weather. Oh, okay. <laughs> I went back in the summer to go hiking <laughs> okay. and such. Yeah. Okay, Lovely. Lovely. Okay. Um, Woo, women power, okay. <laughs> Joanne's asking, yay for women, what is the environment for other areas of diversity? Is this growing in the field? Yeah, and it needs to grow faster. It needs to grow more and faster. It really okay. does. Okay. Um, I think, you know, in, in all areas of diversity, I think at, at Purdue, we are making a conscious effort to try to have a more diverse student population, a more diverse faculty population. Mm -hmm. So I think we're doing the right things, but um, I wish it would move even faster. Okay, okay, thank you. What advice would you give current vet med female students? <laughs> I think we had answered that a question. Maybe you can give a second advice? Um, have fun. Have fun, <laughs> yeah. I love that. Enjoy your career, <laughs> yeah. yeah. For, for you're either here for, is it, how, how many years is it again? Four years. Four and then so four. So four of undergrad, college. four of vet school, and okay. if you decide you want to specialize another four years after that, okay. and then if you want to do a lot of research, you might tack on a PhD or a postdoc after that. So, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So quite a bit of time. <laughs> but as long as you're enjoying it yes. along the way, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And find an amazing place like Purdue to do right. it. Yep. And then yep. you've got that. Okay, great. Thank you. You mentioned immunotherapy. What types of pet cancers are being looked at, tested for effectiveness of immunotherapy? Well, I think immunotherapy is really fascinating. And can you please just define that? Sure. It's, it's therapy that, that has anti-cancer effects by making the immune system attack the cancer. Okay. And so it's interesting, really, really interesting, and in that I mentioned though as a class of drugs that we studied um, right as I was coming in to Purdue, and that class of drugs was developed for anti-inflammatory effects. And what we discovered way back then was their true anti-cancer effects. We didn't know how because we knew we knew the drug did not directly kill the tumor cells. Um, to kill tumor cells growing in a dish, you have to do like 300 times more of that drug than you'd ever get mm. safely. So, but what has continued to emerge over the last, especially five years, is those drugs are having potent effects at making the immune system work better. And we think that's their major mechanism of action. Okay. So the same thing with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is working in large part through the immune response. Um, and I, I say this probably too often and the vet students sort of roll their eyes when I say <laughs> it now, but you know, chemotherapy has never really made sense because we'll take a drug, say one of the drugs we use is a drug called vinblastine. You give it every two weeks. It's only in the body four hours. So like how does it control the cancer for two weeks if it's only in the body for four, four hours? hours? It's mm -hmm. because it is causing an immunologic effect as well. And then we're studying a true immunotherapy. It's uh, in the class of drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And the reason we want to study that is not only do we want another therapy option for dogs, but in humans, we need to figure out how to make those work more often. They can work really, really well, but not often enough. So that's mm -hmm. why we are developing one for dogs to help dogs and improve how those work in people. Okay, thank you. That question was from Karen. So I have, next one from Anna. Has any of your own dogs had cancer? Yeah, they have. My, uh, in fact, this, this sent me down the whole route of research early in my mm. career. So um, it's one of those fascinating stories. Again, looking back on it, it should have been an aha moment. It was an aha moment and mm -hmm. I didn't appreciate it. But when I was in veterinary school, one of my dogs developed a very large cancer on the side of his chest. And it had eaten through three ribs and it was pretty uncomfortable. And I talked to my professors at Auburn where I was in veterinary school and said, how, how can I help my dog? And they said, well, we don't know anything that'll work. You can try to cut it out, but you aren't gonna get it all. And that's you know, gonna be a really painful surgery. 
So he was uncomfortable, and we put him on an anti-inflammatory drug just for pain relief. Mm -hmm. And his tumor became no longer visible. We couldn't feel it anymore. His ribs recalcified, and he lived like 13 months. It didn't go away, but it was, it didn't, I mean, he lived 13 months, and it didn't bother him. And mm -hmm. so then one of my other dogs developed cancer. And again, it was a different kind of cancer, but, but there was no known treatment. And we said, well, you know, he's got arthritis, and, you know, this did something interesting the first dog, so let's do it. And he, is, he had large masses throughout his lungs, and they all disappeared. And when he oh. died, we did an autopsy and couldn't find any cancer. So uh, those should have been big aha moments. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I, I came to Pur Purdue thinking, oh, oncology, that stuff happens every day, and it doesn't. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so that was definitely a stimulus for going Absolutely. down that research path. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. If so, were you able to try new medications or procedures with them? Yeah, you can. And okay. one, of the, one of the good and bad things about veterinary oncology is, sadly, for a lot of cancers we treat, there's not a good effective treatment. And, or you might have one and then it works for a while and then it fails, and so then what do you do? And so that's really the, the, a good opportunity to try something new. And we have more leeway to try new things in mm -hmm. animals. It's not as restrictive as it is in humans. Like for me to do oh. it, mm -hmm. I have to know that it's likely to be safe. I have to know that much. I have to have seen lab dog safety data to know that what I'm doing is likely to be safe if I'm going to give it to somebody's pet. Mm -hmm. And you know, nothing's guaranteed in medicine. There are always unexpected things, but, but we have the opportunity to try new things and, and try them more quickly. And in some instances, we'll try them as the frontline therapy. You know, maybe the standard of care doesn't work very good or it's toxic or it's too expensive. And then mm -hmm. there are times that we'll go ahead and try something new early on, okay. which is okay. good. Can you compare, um, kind of branching off the study of veterinary medicine in oncology in the United States versus, for example, Western Europe? I think actually Europe's right up there with, with us okay. in veterinary medicine. I, I really do. Europe is, Australia is, Japan. I mean, there, there, mm -hmm. there's good veterinary medicine all over the world. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, and so. the study in, with, with regards to oncology? Yes. Would yeah. you say so? Okay. Yeah, I okay. would. I would. Okay. I'd, I'd say there's, you know, there's great research being done everywhere. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Lisa uh, Hinsman says, has there been any recent research on cancer in intact dogs versus spayed and neutered dogs? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> so um, that's something that needs to be studied in Europe because spaying mm. and neutering is much less common in Europe. and. Mm -hmm. We know that spaying and neutering can actually increase the risk of some cancers. We're not saying move away from spaying and neutering because if we do, one in four dogs is going to get mammary tumors. Oh. They're going to get pyometras or uterine infections. They're going to be they're going to be unwanted pregnancies. There's going to be a different kind of prostate cancer in male dogs. So I'm not saying get away from spaying and neutering, but we do need to figure out why that actually increases risk because hmm. it does. Okay. I think the answer may be, at what age do you do that? But we don't yet know enough to know, should we be waiting a few more months? Or, you know, we, right. that's something we need to figure out. So everything's still kind of in the beginning stage with, with cards to this, kind of. Do you find that funding is hard to find lately? Funding's always a challenge. Hmm. It always mm -hmm. has been, and it always will be. Okay. And <laughs> so. Yeah. Amanda goes on, is there an ebb and flow over the years where sponsors are restricted of this type of research spending? Do you, do you prefer federal sponsors, foundations, or industry? I think that what has allowed us to be successful through the years is we diversify in our funding. Okay. We have had federal grants. We've had foundation grants. Um, We've, we honestly have been extremely fortunate to receive gift funding from grateful pet owners and others. Mm. And there are years, there are years that that carries our program. And it's, mm. the, the gift funding is so important because if you get a federal grant, they only give you 70 to 80% of what you need anyway. And then some of the most exciting, by far, some of the most important work we've ever done is because we've had gift funds. So then we mm -hmm. can get that done, and then that enables to get a grant to pay for more of it. Like this immunotherapy thing we're doing, that's, 
we paid for that with gift funds for three to four years. And then we got a government contract, and now we have a really nice government grant. But you know, the gift fund was what was what was able to make that happen. Yeah. Yep. 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 So yeah, we we diversify, and, and if you that's one of the advantages clinical researchers have mm -hmm. over purely basic science researchers. It's it's it, to some extent people may be more more excited about donating to a clinical research program mm. sometimes, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. That was Amanda. So, 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 and then Linda says, thank you, Dr. Knapp, for everything you did for Thanks, our Linda. Border Collie. Bess, yes. you, can you tell us a little bit about Bess? Um, yeah, Bess was great. Um, she had bladder cancer, unfortunately. Um, she was owned by the Hensmans, and Dr. Hensman mm -hmm. was a long-term faculty member in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Okay. So we, we enjoyed seeing them, seeing Bess. Um, unfortunately, at some point, her, her cancer became resistant to our therapies, and we always wish it had worked mm. longer. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, thanks for tuning in, and <laughs> we still remember you all very fondly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Someone's asking, what can we do to protect our dogs and cats from developing cancer? Well, I'll speak to bladder cancer. Okay. So first, okay. But okay. here are the things. We already know there are things that can be done to reduce the risk. And this is probably most important in dogs that have an inherited risk because they already, they already have one strike against them. Okay. But the things that, that pet owners can do are avoid long chemicals, avoid cigarette smoke, um, don't let them get obese because obesity is a risk factor. To the extent you can, avoid polluted water and air, which is easier mm. said than done. So in, in a study we just did, the major risk factors were, um, in that particular study, were exposure to secondhand cigarette smoke, living wow. near a marsh, because marshes trap pollutants and sometimes they're sprayed for mosquitoes. Um, and then, um, you know, over the years we've I guess another thing I'd say, don't use the old generation flea control products, the old dips and powders and sprays, don't use those because they okay. greatly increase risk. And then, and we're advocating in high risk breeds to start screening about age six because we, there will okay. be dogs that get it as early as age six. It may peak at nine or 10, but, but we're, we're going to you know, screening. suggest screening at age six and up. Okay. That was very helpful. Thank you. And this was for bladder cancer. Yeah, you know, for the others, for the others, um, I think a lot of that probably applies. Try to limit exposure to carcinogens. Um, mm -hmm. Try to keep the animal healthy, healthy body weight, active. You know, eating good food, mm -hmm. um, getting exercise. So you know, the same things that we talk about for us right. <laughs> will help they animals apply to too. Our heart for babies. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure. Um, Please go ahead and continue ask, asking questions in the chat. And while you do that, I'll go ahead and ask some questions that were proposed to me by some of my colleagues. So first one was, how do you select a veterinarian? Well, if it were me, I'd ask my friends. Okay. <laughs> I would ask my friends, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, do they have a veterinarian they really like? Um, okay. You can, you know, go to their website, see do they have a good education. You can sort of get a flavor for what the practice is like from their website. I mean, you can see what things they emphasize. Um, and then, honestly, word of mouth really helps a okay. lot. If you are seeking out a specialist, then there are websites you can go to, like if you want a cardiologist. Their, their website will tell you where all the board-certified cardiologists are in your region of the country. Okay. Um, if for specialty care, those websites help, universities help. But for primary care, you know, I, I, I would ask my friends okay. what experiences they have. Okay, yeah. word of mouth too, thank you. How do you choose what, this is another question from um, one of our listeners, is how do you choose what food to give, dry, canned, homemade, or refrigerated for your dog? I really think for a lot of dogs, a name brand dry dog food okay. is perfectly fine. If the dog is in a high-risk breed for bladder cancer, we'd suggest supplementing them with fresh vegetables three times a week. That probably helps for other carcinomas, but amongst like Scottish Terriers, those that eat veggies three times a week have a 70% reduction in their cancer risk. Wow. So, you know, a name brand food is fine. If you want to make a homemade diet, mm. fine. Just, you know, 
include all the major food groups. Um, mm -hmm. We don't really get excited about the raw diets because it's a good way to spread salmonella, and so okay. that's you know not a good thing. And I think there, I wish we knew more about supplements. People always ask me, you know, what supplements should we give? And mm -hmm. supplements can't do harm, right? Well, they can, because I haven't used this yet in a lecture, but I should. So mm -hmm. back in high school, when we studied Greek mythology and everything, we studied sayings, and one of those carved on the shrine of Delphi in Greece is, know thyself and nothing in excess. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, if a person or a dog or a cat. So let's say one of my colleagues studied vitamin E selenium. So he took old dogs and he supplemented them with vitamin E selenium to try to prevent prostate cancer. And in that mm. study, the dogs that got the supplement got more cancer. They had a higher rate of cancer because if you're eating a good diet, you have enough vitamin E selenium. And if you supplement it, then you push it into the range that actually increases cancer risk. So I think we need to know more. You know, we, we don't know enough that I can tell somebody which supplement to give and which one not to give because I know there's a decent chance that it could do more harm than good. I think we'll have to retitle this um, session with that quote that you <laughs> okay. just gave. So, <laughs> but thank you for that, and also all these tips that you've um, given about you know how to how can we help our, our fur babies. Thank you. Um, what advice would you give to parents whose child wants a dog but they don't? I would really try <laughs> to see if there's a compromise position. Okay. I mean, pets do so incredibly much to help children. Mm. I, I can't tell you how much they do. They teach responsibility. They teach unconditional love. Um, I've got some, some good friends that, that are going through a really tough time with family in Ukraine. And, and I, I know that their dog is, is like the, is the greatest support mm -hmm. for three generations of the family. Mm -hmm. So I would you know, encourage people to see, is there an option is there an option to have a pet? It doesn't have to be a dog. You know, it could be mm -hmm. something else. But I just, I, I, can, I couldn't imagine myself growing up without pets. Mm -hmm. I had dogs. I had ducks. I had rabbits. I had turtles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, you know, look at my kids growing up and, and the dogs. That was just, it was just another dimension in life that I think really helped them. There's so, so many benefits of having a yeah. baby, isn't there? So I'd <laughs> say, see if there's a way. Yeah, if, see if, if, there, if there isn't, then don't push it. You mm -hmm. know, it's better mm -hmm. not to have a pet than have a pet that you can't take care of. Absolutely. But, yeah. Yeah, that brings us back to like um, COVID puppies, right? When people were yep. adopting that. Can you, yep. want to, you want to speak on that a little bit? Just that, it, uh, just that there was a massive uh, surge in adoptions during COVID. And then and, what happened when people went back to work? Well, I think, you know, I, we hear that some of them are ending up back in the shelter, but I don't really, I'm not aware of that with the okay. shelters that I know much about. Okay. You know, it, they aren't, they're finding a way to, to keep those dogs. So I, I'm sure it's creating stress. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think, I think a lot of them did find lifelong homes. And comfort yeah. during this, this oh, yeah. during the pandemic. For sure. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Let's see if we have any other questions. Um, okay. If you live in Tippecanoe New County, use primary care at PVM. I do. <laughs> they have That's kept where my the dog goes. kids happy and healthy for many years. Yep. Thanks, Joanne. <laughs> my dog Addie goes there. <laughs> <laughs> How many dogs do you have? Okay, I just have one. And what kind yeah. of dog is it? A little yellow lab. Oh, She's lovely. great. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Is cancer becoming a higher risk in labs? That's what's another question. I think it's, um, I think there, there are two issues. How much cancer was there all along that we just didn't the diagnose? Mm -hmm. And then if you track, if you track the caseload in university teaching hospitals and you track the proportion of animals that have cancer, it's definitely going up. Mm. But I think part of that is recognition and being more in tune and diagnosing it more versus it used to be, you know, labeled something else. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think it's increasing, but I think there's also a greater awareness. So we see more of it because we look for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
That was by Joanne. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're about to wrap up, but before we do, do you have any last words you'd like to share or tips with us um, for this evening regarding your work or study or anything? I, I think it's great to have a woman's organization like this. Oh, well, thank uh, you. I really do. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think this is great. Um, you know, I, I'm aware of some of the other the speakers you've had, and, and mm -hmm. I think it's you know just a really high quality program, and I'd say keep doing it. Well, thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we will, okay. and we will be having us in September uh, a reunion with all past speakers. Oh, cool. That I'll be inviting you all back, and then we'll have a. Obviously, it'll be live streamed again, so okay. we welcome. Sure. Hopefully, you'll be able to come cool. to that one. So that'll be in September. But thank you. Um, I think someone else wrote one more thing. Amanda Martin. Yes. Does that ring a bell? Yes. Okay. With COVID, our office has moved home for remote work. Is there a good way to transition my dog from not having me there all the time <laughs> if I have to move back to the office? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, gradually, <laughs> gradually, <laughs> with. The, mm -hmm with um you know a slow transition would be good um realizing there may be some anxiety around separation mm -hmm. and you might have to work on that front um at least in lynn hall we get to bring our animals to work with Do us you? they have to pass a test what's the test like well it's, it's a test to be sure that they behave appropriately and that they're okay. friendly and that they're you know they're not loud and they're not disruptive but you know, in, in our building, we get to bring our dogs. So you might, we might get some phone calls, and how do we get that kind of uh, world passed yeah. in our in our building? So, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Okay, thank you. So slowly, yeah. <laughs> and gently with our exactly. with our fur babies, just like we would with our own kids. Yep. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you. Now comes um, what we call a lightning round okay. um, part of the the evening in where I ask you um, about 15 questions. Okay. One of them is a little bit different. I'm going to show you a picture that Stephanie okay. will bring up, and then you just kind of have to give me your quick thoughts about that picture, Okay. and then which the audience will see, and then we will go. Um, so if you would like to answer the question as well in your head or on the chat, feel free. If she gets stuck on a question, you can also help Debbie out. So Please. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. OK, here, are, are we ready? So he's going to play a TikTok, <laughs> like okay. a time. OK. Dogs versus cats. I prefer dogs. OK. There are De some very nice cats, though. OK. Define comparative oncology in one sentence. It's studying naturally occurring cancer to help animals and people. OK. Favorite dog breed? Labrador. Of course, I was going to say. <laughs> if you could speak to any Purdue alum, who would it be and why? Oh, I don't know. That one, that one you might have me on. OK. Um, just, OK. We can, we can back, go back to that if you want. I don't know if I can name just one. <laughs> OK, top three. OK. Uh, Purdue alums. Uh, let's come back to that. OK. Yeah. Best place to walk your dog on campus? I think campus is pretty dog friendly. So <laughs> okay. as long as they're on a leash, okay. pretty much anywhere. Okay. Your favorite celebrity dog? I would say this dog named Spencer that used to attend the Boston Marathon. Okay. In fact, this is really cool. Spencer was a golden retriever, used to attend the Boston Marathon every year, held a Boston Strong flag in his mouth. Oh. Sadly, he died of cancer. So this year, an initiative was put together to bring some other Goldens. They were thinking they'd get 12, and they got 250. Oh, wow. So apparently the day before the marathon, there were 250 Golden Retrievers oh. in downtown Boston to honor Spencer. I thought that was cool. That was that's, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. Didn't the Boston just happen over the Yesterday. Week? Yesterday yeah. over the week. Okay, yeah. weekend. Oh, wonderful. I'll have to yeah. Google that. Okay, so Spencer. Your go-to dog movie? Homeward Bound, probably. Okay. One piece of advice... Nope, we're going to skip that one. Three fun facts about dogs that most people don't know. Oh, dear. Uh, three fun facts about dogs. Uh, domesticated thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have a friendliness gene that evolved as they were domesticated that enabled them to, to learn to live with people. Is that the side um, eye that they do? Uh, I don't think so. That kind of gets so. there. The, okay, okay, yeah. go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and one more fact. One more fact. There are uh, like 70 million of them in the U.S. Really? Yeah. I, know I don't that. know if it's 60 or 70, but somewhere up there. That's, wow, okay. 
If you had unlimited funds, where would you invest it in at Purdue and why? I would invest in cancer research. I was going to say, that's a pretty easy <laughs> question there, answer there. Most memorable moment this school year? Okay, most memorable moment this school year. Mm -hmm. um, we had a pretty nice one last Saturday. I don't know if it counts as the yes. most memorable, but several of us attended the Cancer Center 5K Challenge. Yes. And we honored um, the, um, a friend's husband who had passed away another friend that had passed away, and then people that are living with cancer. Yes. So, yeah, that was, I'd say that, that ranks up as a top event for the year. Thank you. I didn't know that there was a difference between the gray shirts and the white t-shirts. Yeah, yeah. So I, that was kind of shocking. So for those that weren't there, the gray was just... It's all of us, right? Mm -hmm. And the white are survivors? They're survivors. Yeah, exactly. that was That was impactful. You're running and yeah. then you see this. It, yeah. it's, it, was, it, yeah. it was amazing. The best part of your work? I think variety. Variety, variety. Mm -hmm. progress, um, new things. Okay. And Stephanie's going to bring up a picture. Okay. If I can pull it up on my phone, I can show it to you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's when I met. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Like, can I take a picture? <laughs> That's from the run this past Saturday. Yep, and I was like, and I wanted to know who... Um, we had these shirts made for our friend Kurt. Okay. He passed away from colon That's cancer. That's when you were talking yeah. to your yeah. friends. Okay. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and last question, Purdue is? Great. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And that wraps it up. So if there aren't any other questions in the chat, what we will do now is take a selfie. <laughs> okay. Go ahead if you want. With our toast, with our yeah, we can toast okay. with that. It's Stephanie, would you take that picture? And we'll just smile. <laughs> I'm just going to uncap it and hold it up. Yep, I, and I will be, and I'll just. I'm not sure if I'm fighting off something, so I wanted to keep sure. it to myself. Absolutely. Okay, Stephanie, just let us know when you're ready. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> okay, we right. are. And that's a wrap. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you Debbie. Thank you so much. I enjoyed getting to talk to you and spend the evening together. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate this yeah. evening. Yes, and I look forward to seeing you again after the summer sometime. Thanks. And maybe dropping by the, vet, the new yeah, vet school yeah, and yeah, seeing sure. all the work yeah. that you're doing there. So thank you. Yep. Um, just a few announcements before we end. Okay. We've got May 9th, Cocktails and Conversation. We're featuring Dr. Mar Marissa Tremblay. She is the, the um, she led a team of other researchers into Antarctica. Marissa will discuss how field work in remote locations, including Antarctica and Tibet, shaped her career and worldview. Um, Stephanie will just share a, a little bit about, we've got the Pretty Women's Conference coming up on June 8th and 9th. It'll be on campus for the first time. Um, and we're excited about this event that will, um, be taking place so she's got the schedule that everybody's seeing that so on Wednesday June 7th we've actually got have a relationship a celebrity relationship coach that's going to be coming in and talking to Bella Gandhi talk, talking to us about that and then Thursday and Friday will be we've got 20 plus speakers coming in to talk about all kinds of professional personal and um, um, topics for all of us to uh, to um, to listen to and then we've got on that Thursday evening, it's going to be fun. It's a garden party. We're going to have wow. make bouquets and do uh, the knowledge lab is going to be coming down. We're going to be able to do some kind of activities, and then we will end it with um, on Friday afternoon. A uh, special guest that for the Thursday will be Sharon Hagel. Oh, cool! She was one of the astronauts, and so cool. um, coming in for so please if you haven't already, registration is open. So please, um, Stephanie will put the link in the chat and yeah, register. Um, and then, Ed, if you could please show the movie, I mean the teaser. That's a wrap. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next month. I hope you have a re great rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.